Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus on the day of his transfiguration. We turn our attention to today's Holy Gospel, the account of the transfiguration from Luke chapter 9 beginning at verse 28. Dear friends in Christ, once again this morning we're reminded of what a cold, dark winter it's been. And now we're about to embark on Lent. Lent, the word Lent, is a shortening of the old English word for to lengthen. Lent got its name not actually from any liturgical account in scripture, but from the lengthening of days, the return of light. And next week, with the return of daylight savings time, that'll become even clearer. What an appropriate picture of what the darkness of this world is like, namely winter. It reminds us of how sad and troublesome life in this world is. There is no shortage of dashed hopes, gloom, and hardship. Ultimately, there is only one thing that can give us any kind of lasting hope and joy, and that one thing is one person, namely Jesus Christ, who is called in Scripture the light of the world. Jesus is eager to let his light shine on us, just the way he himself shone on the day of his transfiguration. Jesus took Peter and James and John and went up on the mountain to pray. While he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothing became dazzling white. Just then, two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They appeared in glory and were talking about his departure, which he was going to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Now, from the day of his conception, Jesus was the Son of God. He was both God and man. He was the Son of God when he was born in Bethlehem. And he was the Son of God when he was baptized by John. He was God when he called his disciples to follow him. And he was God every day when he walked and talked with them. But he looked just like any other man. St. Paul wrote, Christ Jesus, though he was by nature God, did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed, but he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any other man, he humbled himself. You can well imagine that the disciples had a difficult time learning, grasping, and even believing that Jesus truly was the Son of God. After all, they spent time with him day in and day out. While on the one hand they saw him do amazing miracles, on the other hand they also saw Jesus get so tired that He was sound asleep on a cushion in their boat when the storm came up on the Sea of Galilee. They knew Jesus as a man who needed to eat and to sleep just like they did. They could see the power of God come out from his hands and even from his robe sometimes when people touched him. But they never saw him walking around with a halo over his head the way he's sometimes depicted in paintings. Normally, Jesus did not glow like God or even like Moses, for that matter. But today, on this one occasion, they would see Jesus glow. Soon, they would see Jesus humbling himself more than he ever had before up to this point. They would see Jesus looking completely helpless, 
allowing himself to be arrested without even putting up a fight. And they would finally see him even executed by Roman soldiers. For that reason, Jesus wanted at least three of his disciples to see him more in his natural state as the Son of God. They would see him suffer and they would be tempted to despair. And so God wanted them to have this vision fixed in their minds to reassure them. Now, as true man, Jesus needed this special strengthening moment also. The temptations he endured as the Son of Man were more severe and intense than even the worst temptations we could endure. Do you remember what the devil told him? He said, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus himself needed reaffirmation as the glorious Son of God. The shining glory reminded Jesus of what he came to bring to men and how both he and his believers would live after returning to glory if he would only finish his work of salvation. And Jesus needed to be reminded of his friends in heaven, Moses and Elijah. They strengthened Jesus by reminding him of how they had prophesied of him, what they had prophesied of him, namely that he would die for the sins of the world. They spoke with him of the great victory he was soon to win over the devil by dying and rising again. Well, if the disciples needed Jesus' encouragement, if Jesus needed God's encouragement, we certainly need it also, which is why God had the apostles record it. There are many times when we face trials in the world and are tempted to wonder if God really cares. At such times, we need to remember exactly what the disciples saw. This was real. Jesus is not just a man. He is the glorious Son of God, and he has purchased us a share in that glory with his own blood. Just as Moses and Elijah were enjoying new life in heaven with Jesus before Jesus came to earth, so also we are going to live like and with Moses and Elijah and Jesus in glory when we leave this world. The disciples were going to forget this all in the weeks to come. And we often forget it too. Remember the transfiguration. It reminds us who Jesus is. He is our light in the darkness. And the transfiguration also served as a reminder to Jesus just what his mission was. You know, Peter wanted to stay on that mountain forever. He totally lost track of why Jesus came and what Jesus had called him to do for the rest of his life as a fisher of men. Peter and those with him were weighed down with sleep. But when they were completely awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. It wasn't long before that day when Peter had made such a great confession. Speaking for all the other disciples, Peter had said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus commended him so highly for that confession. But then, right after that, Jesus told the disciples he was heading toward Jerusalem to suffer and be handed over and to be crucified and then Peter had said Lord never never 
This shall never happen to you. And Jesus had to rebuke him. And now on this occasion, Peter's saying, Lord, let's never go down from this mountain. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. Just stay put right up here. Let's make this permanent. Peter didn't comprehend just why his Savior came into the world. Jesus came to pay for sin with his life. Could Peter really not have understood all of those millions of animals that had been sacrificed in Jerusalem since the temple was built and in the, in the tabernacle before that? that they were there to show how sin has to be atoned for by the setting, shedding of blood? Didn't Peter realize his own sin that needed blood redemption? Did he really not understand that all those sacrifices were types of the Messiah and that if Jesus then was the Messiah, as Peter himself had said, then he had to suffer as a sacrifice? Had he totally forgotten how John the Baptist pointed at Jesus the day before his baptism and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we're often just as slow as Peter when it comes to understanding and believing. Especially when it comes to things like understanding suffering. Don't we despise it just as much as he did? Even though Jesus told us, take up your cross and follow me? Don't we also envy the world, its success and glory? Even though Jesus said, what will it benefit a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a person give in exchange for his soul? Do we ever regret or resent the fact that instead of just taking us to glory, Jesus tells us to get to work and make disciples of all nations? Jesus did not even answer Peter's suggestion of setting up three tents on the mountain. He mercifully gave Peter the silent treatment. And when we offer foolish suggestions to God about how he should go about his work, sometimes we can also be grateful that God pretends he doesn't hear us say those dumb things. For Peter, James, and John, Jesus' transfiguration was a rare bright spot in an otherwise difficult life. For Jesus, too, the transfiguration served as a bright reminder of the glory that he had left and the glory to which he would return once he had faithfully completed his battle with the prince of darkness. Let the transfiguration be the same kind of reminder to you. Our lives are not lived in glory and splendor up in the clouds. We've got a dirty mission to carry out. We have hardships to face. But the glory that awaits us is real. As the book of Hebrews tells us, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author of our faith and the one who brings it to its goal. In view of the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of God's throne. Carefully consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinful people, so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. And so how do we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus? How do we keep from growing weary and losing heart as we seek to faithfully carry out our work as Jesus' disciples? The answer is in our text where God the Father speaks from heaven. While he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. 
They were afraid as they went into the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. You know what kept getting Peter into trouble? It was not paying attention to Jesus' word or forgetting what Jesus had told him. Just eight days before, Jesus had explained to the disciples not only that he would suffer, but that he had to suffer. But Peter forgot. On Transfiguration Day, Peter wants Jesus to skip Jerusalem entirely and just stay forever on the Mount of Glory. God's response? Listen to him. If Peter had listened before and would listen now, he wouldn't say such dumb things. But more importantly, he wouldn't find himself baffled in Gethsemane, frightful in the courtyard of the Sanhedrin. He wouldn't find himself cursing and swearing that he didn't even know who Jesus was, nor would he find himself out in the darkness weeping bitterly. Listen to him, the Father called out from heaven. If only Peter had been better at doing that. And the same thing applies to us. Listen to him, the Father says. Listen to Jesus. Take his word to heart. Remember what he says in his word. How much grief we bring on ourselves by not simply listening to the word of Jesus. How many unscriptural ideas we still cling to because we don't pay attention when God says, listen to Jesus. How many times we have doubts because we forget that Jesus promised, yes, you will have trouble in this world. And how many times we worry because we forget the Savior's promises to always take care of us. Life is difficult enough in this dark world without forgetting to walk in the light of the Savior and his word. So listen to him. The message of the transfiguration is this. Now is the time of sorrow, but the crown of glory is real, and it most assuredly awaits us. Jesus is God. Jesus is glorified. Jesus shall glorify us, and we will live with him in heaven, all because he first went through suffering, as must also we. As we enter this Lenten season, we will focus again on the suffering that Jesus had to go through. He knows our sufferings and our sorrows firsthand. But as we endure them, he will brighten the path and show us the glory to come through his word. Because he is God's own beloved son and our savior. So listen to him and let him shine on you. Amen.